Hello, everyone. Thank you for your patience as we all get set up and come on in. Um, we are really excited um, to have another Scale House Voices event. Um, my name is Mickey. I am the gallery um, associate here. Um, I'm brand new to the team and I will be working with programming and helping with Ben design. So we're really, really excited to get started and to be able to have another speaker. Um, before we started, we have a few announcements. We wanted to let everyone know that our um, CARES Relief Fund is accepting applications through June 20th from all local creatives. Um, for those of you who may not have heard about this, Scale House is partnering with the Bulletin to raise funds for Central Oregon's creative folks, um, whether that's in design, graphic design, painting, music, um, uh, really anything that's within the arts, we are looking to help out by offering grants and a platform to bring attention to the amazing talent that needs help to continue thriving in our community. Um, so far, we've awarded 20 applicants in the last round and 24 total. So if you are looking to find some support um, and are a creative, please send your applications in by June 20th. Uh, without further ado, we are very, very excited um, to be able to host tonight's Scale House speaker, um, Devon Van Houten Maldonado, here to speak a little bit about his work um, in a world that feels more torn apart by crisis than ever, um, we are really looking to have conversations about how we can um, make that better. So Devon Van Houten Maldonado is a writer, community organizer, and creative based in Chicago. Um, he works as a director of programs for Sky Art, a nonprofit providing free programs for youth on Chicago's south and west sides. Devon leads teams of artists and art therapists providing social emotional learning, um, centered programming and trauma informed therapeutic services at their 6,000 square foot studio um, in schools and at juvenile detention facilities. Um, he's also written extensively about art and culture for publications such as BBC, Freeze Magazine, Flash Art Magazine, Chicago Magazine, um, the list goes on. And so we are very, very excited to hear about some of the healing work you're doing um, and about some of the projects. And thank you for being here and for speaking with us. I'll let you take it away. Thank you so much, Mickey, um, and thank you everyone for attending. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be asked to do this. Um, and I feel truly blessed and privileged. Um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and share my screen. I got a little presentation. Um, so when I was titling this talk, I certainly wanted to have some fun. Uh, and I hope I made you laugh a little bit with the title. Um, being woke and doing the work, art as activism as subject. Um, so one of the first things I want to do is preface um, with some definitions um, about what, what those things mean, right? Um, you know, so when we're thinking about what being woke means, woke is really internet slang um, for being socially progressive, enlightened, and awake to issues of social justice, systemic racism, et cetera, uh, aligned with activist causes often exemplified by engaging in vitriolic discussions on social media and creating posts in solidarity with communities of BIPOC. This is, this is my definition of, of, of wokeness. And I think it's something that uh, isn't very well defined. Later on, we'll have a, a definition from David Brooks. Um, the work, uh, it's also internet slang for performing undefined labor uh, in service of social justice causes. For example, I'm doing the work often used to loosely define work associated with the self, i.e. self-care, self-promotion, etc. To do the work suggests activist labor that is universal and toiling towards a more equitable future without providing specifics about measurable goals or outcomes. Um, so one of the things that I'm gonna really uh, come back to a few times in this presentation is specificity. Uh, and when we're thinking about um, activism or um, being woke or doing the work, uh, we're thinking about and demanding specificity about what that means. Um, I like to use the term rescuing specificity. Um, and then when we're thinking about activism and what that means, um, you know, Ibrahim X. Kendi has a, has a fairly uh, strict definition of activism. His, his definition of an activist is someone who is someone with a known record of power and policy alterations. Um, I'm not quite that strict. Uh, my definition of activism is working to alleviate the suffering of, of oppressed communities. Um, I think 
working to alleviate other suffering um, makes you feel good. Uh, and it's, and it's not as, uh, it's not as strict as Ibrahim X. Kendi, um, where he's talking about major policy change uh, or anything like that. Um, but when I was thinking about uh, this talk, when I was asked to do it, um, you know, I, I didn't really feel like it made sense for me to deliver a traditional artist talk. Um, you know, I, I'm not, a, I'm not an artist per se. Um, you know, I've been an artist, I'm, I've been a writer. Um, now I have the honor to, to work with uh, communities in, in Chicago and, and be a, a leader um, in the social, se uh, social services sector. Um, and, and it just felt more appropriate to talk about that given the, the current moment. Um, and also just, you know, how, how proud and blessed I am to be part of, uh, be a part of the community and um, to participate in this work. Um, so just a, just a quick outline. I have a, like 55 slides to get through. So that's why I'm jumping right in. I'm gonna try to blaze through them. I definitely wanna leave time for Q and A. Um, Cause it, you know, I know there's some people on this call including some awesome colleagues who have uh, great things to say about the work that we're doing. Um, so I'm going to give some background about why we're here, um, about my work at SkyArt, um, some of the work that we've done in response to the pandemic over the last year and a half, uh, not quite, um, adverse childhood experiences, um, how those affect uh, children in the communities that we work with, um, youth who are traumatized and incarcerated, uh, and SkyArt's program called Just Us, which is our program for incarcerated youth. Uh, and then getting back to this uh, more of a discussion about art as activism as subject, uh, I'll include a diatribe about social media in there. Uh, and then I'll get back to this idea of rescuing specificity uh, with some ideas about um, how we can be more activist, what activism means, um, and that it's okay not to be an activist as well. Um, so again, thank you for being here. I'm gonna jump right into um, a throwback uh, to 2014. Uh, some of you out in Oregon might, may have seen this work. This was a collaboration that I did with Modu Dieng for the 2014 Portland Biennial. Um, this series was uh, centered on a, on a barbershop in Portland, one of the few black barbershops in Portland where I went to get my hair cut. You know, I have curly hair and, you know, I always end up um, having a hard time finding a place to get my hair cut, um, as a lot of mixed race people do in, in white communities. Um, and I went to this barbershop and, and Modu, who is from Senegal, um, had kind of never been to a barbershop before. Uh, and he experienced this clash of African culture and African-American culture. Um, and it became this rich area of exploration. So we did this big, uh, like 30 foot uh, by 10 foot painting. We, we designed it as a billboard. Um, you know, it's, it's made up of a combination of uh, printed photographs uh, and paint um, on like a PVC material. Uh, and then there was uh, synonymously a, a big billboard right in downtown Portland, um, uh, right on the, the east side of the Burnside Bridge. This was, I, I had just finished my degree at PNCA, Pacific Northwest College of Art. Um, Modu and I had been working together for a while. Modu was uh, really a mentor of mine, uh, helped me get my foot into um, exhibiting art. Um, and we did this awesome project. And you can see that the, the work at the gallery kind of reflects the, the billboard. Uh, this is a close-up of the billboard. Again, it's using some of the same imagery, uh, but this is a digital work. Uh, it, was, it was really awesome to drive over the Burnside Bridge and, and see this work. And again, this was for the 2014 by Portland Biennial, which is uh, curated by Amanda Hunt, um, who's an incredible curator. Uh, and it was an honor to be part of that with Modu. Uh, we also did, a, did an exhibition uh, at Linfield College uh, the year previously. And um, I think this, I think the, um, the big painting is actually up at uh, um, uh, Clatsop Community College. Um, if I'm not mistaken, um, it might still be up uh, out in Astoria, Oregon, if, if you have a chance to go see it. Um, after college, after, after I did the Portland Biennial, um, I had decided to move to Mexico City. Um, it was really important for me to get out of the United States. Um, I was really eager to learn Spanish. Uh, and, you know, I kind of imagine myself like renting a light filled studio and, um, you know, being discovered as a painter. Uh, and needless to say, that's not how it happened. Um, but, you know, for the first couple of years I was in, I was in Mexico City, I was doing a lot of painting. So this is some of the work that I did while I was there. Um, this, the one on the, the left is actually a big piece. It's about three feet by four feet. And the one on the right is a small piece, small work on paper. Um, and, and, you know, interestingly, uh, painting started to feel a lot like work. You know, I think I, I had to have this realization that 
Um, I was like so obsessed with uh, being a successful painter, you know, even being a famous painter uh, and with what those things mean that I was like putting this ridiculous pressure on myself and um, not really even enjoying it. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, uh, part of the reason I wanted to talk about specifically about being woke and doing the work in activism um, is that I think uh, there's, a, there's, a, there's a big desire uh, in the quote unquote art world, whatever that means, right? Um, to, to be more activist, to, to uh, create systems that are more equitable. Um, but unfortunately, because uh, the whole system teaches us that it's all about us, um, it's about me as an individual artist and my personality, um, and, and I totally fell into that trap. Um, you know, it, for me, like being a, a successful painter was the biggest thing in the world. Uh, and I really had to let that go in order to kind of uh, feel better uh, and realize that there was so much out there. And, and for so many reasons, um, I was in Mexico City learning uh, so many different uh, things and, and really growing up, you know, really struggling. Um, I was working at a, a, a daily newspaper called The News, which is, is not a name that I made up. That's really what, was, what it was called. Uh, it's a national newspaper in Mexico uh, that was distributed to all the beach towns so all the expats and stuff could read it. But, you know, I found myself like thrown into this bizarre world of like corruption uh, in the government. Um, I was making $500 a month uh, surviving on that. Uh, so, you know, I had, to, I was just having this uh, experience that was kind of like beyond my own imagination what, of what I ever could have imagined and, and painting just um, started to feel sort of less, uh, less urgent. Um, and, and, but, but I continued to do it and, and sort of like felt like I was banging my head against the wall for a long time. At the same time that I was writing, um, I started, you know, writing in some publications like Hyperallergic uh, in the United States. Um, and I did some, some residencies. I did a residency at this place called Casa. It's uh, Centro de las Artes de San Agustin in Oaxaca, Mexico, which is incredible, um, where I made this gif here on the left. This is like a gif representing a, a limpia ceremony, which is a Mexican like exorcism type ceremony where you're using smoke and, and um, herbs and, and an egg to uh, exercise uh, bad, bad vibes, bad energy demons out of you. Um, so this is kind of like a limpia and a gif. And then this gif on the right, I actually love this weird sculpture. Um, it's literally like a uh, concrete poured in a bucket with this uh, Caesar's head stuck on top. Um, I don't know where that sculpture is, it's somewhere in Mexico. Um, and so I, I kind of had this uh, interesting uh, realization where uh, painting wasn't making me happy, happy anymore. Um, and I was having some success writing. So I really turned my uh, attention to writing. Um, so I spent uh, you know five years total in Mexico um, writing and, and I um, was lucky enough to write for some of the, um, you know, some of the biggest publications in the world. Um, the story of, um, you know, wanting to be a famous painter and sort of like pushing so hard and, and all the ego involved with that uh, eventually took the form of this novella called Arcoides. Um, Arcoides is the protagonist in this book and, and, and I, I published it last year as a web project after almost four years of working on it, really three years of working on it. Um, and so it lives as this web, web project, which when you look at it on your phone, you can kind of just have this really, which I think is this beautiful uh, infinite scroll. Um, so I encourage you to, uh, to, to look at this. Um, it, it's, a, it's a work of fiction. It's a dystopian work of fiction um, about the end of the world in Mexico City, but it's also a love story. And I think there's a lot of beauty in it as well. Um, I wanted to share some of my uh, writing. This is kind of in no way a comprehensive list, but um, some of the, my, my favorite um, writing, uh, let, let's see, this William Kentridge piece uh, is from 2015. So this was like the, you know, old PDFs of, of the, uh, the pieces that I was writing for the, for the newspaper uh, way back in the day. Um, let's see, Gabriel de la Mora is an incredible Mexican artist. Um, he made this awesome, let's see if we can see it. Oh, I didn't include a picture of it, but he made this, he, he has this incredible work where he burns single pieces of paper and has figured out a way to burn a single piece of paper while keeping it intact. So uh, it's a really beautiful statement about ephemerality. Um, you know, this piece here, I love, it's actually about, um, it, it's a speaker stand. Um, it, uh, it's, well, it's a speaker cover. And so the sound of the speaker kind of makes sound over the year, over, over the years rather. Um, so I, I, I continue to write um, for all sorts of different um, publications. Um, you can see uh, Hyperallergic 
is in here a lot. I wrote a lot for Hyperlogic, a lot, wrote a lot for Ozzy, and I started writing for uh, bigger and bitter, bigger um, publications, you know, including including the BBC, um, including uh, the New York Observer, um, now you know for Freeze and, and some of these other big art publications, um, and and I got to experience sort of the flip side of the art world, which was you know now artists were coming to me and and, and asking for my attention, and I think you know it was interesting to be an artist who was so starved for other people's attention, so starved for curators' attention. Um, all you want is to exhibit your work. All you want is that chance. And then when you're on the other side of it, it's like you realize that it's just sort of an empty exchange, um, or can be. I don't want to say it always is. Um, but you know, I've, I've had the privilege of, of like sitting down and, and interviewing and meeting with um, you know some of the most famous artists in the world. You know, I've, I've interviewed uh, Luke Toymans. I interviewed Amako Bafo last year, who's like you know one of the biggest stars in the art world right now. Um, and so, and and we'll get to Skyart in a second. But one of the great things that I've been to do, been able to do at Skyart uh, with this experience is is connect some of these artists with Skyart. You know, last summer uh, we were able to do a studio visit with Indijeka Crosby, um, who is a MacArthur genius, as a, as a lot of you will know, um, and Mel Chin, another MacArthur fellow. Um, so uh, around this time, um, in I think uh, two thousand and eighteen. Might have been 2017. Um, I did a fellowship um, with the Oregon Institute of Creative Research, which is founded by Anne Marie Oliver and Barry Sanders, who were professors at um, Pacific Northwest College of Art when I attended there. And they invited me to um, uh, to be a fellow at their spring colloquium. Um, and so it was like you know a, a couple of days of um, you know philosophical discussion, and um, I, you know I presented a video there, a video work there. Um, by a Mexican artist, and um, and it was really interesting. And and there I met uh, this this wonderful artist named Chris Casey, who said that um, there was an organization in in Chicago that was looking for for um, to to hire a, a program manager. And I, I was looking to move to Chicago. Um, I was looking to get out of Mexico. You know, um, you know, my my time in Mexico, I continued to earn you know maybe a thousand dollars a month at the high end. Um, which you know goes a, lo a longer way in Mexico than it does in the United States, but uh, you know it's still very um, month by month, week by week, um, you know, waiting for invoices to be paid out ninety days later, um, you know, having to ask my dad for a couple hundred dollars here and there, um, and you know I think here is a good place to say that um, I always sort of. Uh, even if I didn't articulate or recognize the privilege to be able to call up my parents and say, hey, you know, I need a plane to get home. This is terrible. Um, you know, I, I survived uh, the biggest earthquake that Mexico City had um, in the last 25 years um, in 2016, uh, which was pretty scary. Uh, my house got broken into when I was criticizing the government and they like left my passport open on, the, on my desk to warn me and stole my camera and my computer. Um, because I, you know, that's the kind of thing that happens in Mexico. Um, so, you know, I faced a, uh, there was a lot of challenges that I was dealing with in Mexico, and I was feeling, um, you know, writing was great. Uh, it, it's funny this perception that I think happens often in the art world, where um, on the surface, you know, you can be a successful art writer, writing for the BBC, writing for Freeze, writing for Observer, uh, publishing every week, and then uh, the reality is that you know you're trying to figure out how to pay for groceries, racking up. Um, you know, a credit card bill that you don't know how you're going to pay for. Um, but again, uh, I was extremely lucky, lucky um, that I had the privilege to, you know, know that I was going to be okay, know that I had a family that um, had my back. But um, the experience really made me um, sort of realize that uh, so many people don't have that. I mean, I think in, in a place like Mexico City, uh, you can't avoid poverty. Poverty uh, is in your face. Um, and uh, I think, again, uh, through through those things, um, the art world seemed. Uh, I was more, more more and more kind of disillusioned with the with the the contemporary art world, the, the quote unquote art world. You know, I think going to art fairs and and all those things um, felt a little um, empty. And and I was certainly looking to uh, leave Chicago and. Um, or sorry, leave Mexico City and, and start something new. Um, I met my current girlfriend in Mexico City. She was um, she was uh, assisting um, an art, the artist who actually made these paintings right behind me. Called uh, her name is um, Chelsea Culprit, incredible artist. 
Um, and, and, and I met her there and, and we kind of had a back and forth for a couple of years actually. And then uh, I came to visit her in Chicago and, and really fell in love with Chicago. And shortly after that, I met this woman, Chris. Um, and Chris introduced me to Skyar and, and I interviewed at Skyar. And I think the best way to um, show you all a little bit about Skyar is video because videos speak a lot louder than words. So I'm gonna, just gonna play this video. I'll kind of talk while it's going. Um, but Skyar is, uh, you know, I, I walked into Skyar and I kind of like was like, oh, I want to work here. Uh, you know, it's this big uh, 6,000 square foot studio. It was a, a former cleaners. It's in a neighborhood in South Chica in Chicago, um, on the south side of Chicago. It's actually called South Chicago. Uh, it, it's a really unique uh, neighborhood. It was historically a steel workers neighborhood, lots of steel mills, uh, lots of heavy industry, uh, unique to Chicago, which is, is one of the most segregated cities in the United States, um, is that it's about 50-50 Latino uh, and African-American and that's very much reflected in the population that we serve. It's a very low income community. Um, you know, it's a community that faces a, a lot of difficulties with violence, uh, with poverty, and then also with pollution, um, environmental pollution from the steel mills, uh, from the leftovers of, of, of this industry um, that has uh, gone on for so long. Um, and, and so I walked into Skyart, I, I, I interviewed with uh, Sarah Ward, the executive director and the, and the then um, director of creative strategies. And I sort of just like knew I had to have this job. Um, my resume didn't really fit, right? Like I was a journalist, I, had, I was an artist, um, you know, I hadn't worked for anybody in a, a couple of years, four years or five years. Um, but, I, but I really bugged Sarah. I like to say that I bugged her until she gave me the job. I, you know, if, if journalism taught me one thing, it was, it was to be persistent. Um, and, and I'm glad I did because uh, um, three years, almost three years later, uh, now I'm the director of programs at Skyart. Um, and I'll pause here to just say that, you know, when we're thinking about activism, when we're thinking about making a difference in community or community organizing, uh, it's only possible with a team. Um, you know, every day I walk into Skyart and, and, and I'm grateful uh, for the team of people I get to work with. I mean, uh, you can see that, you know, we basically fill the spectrum of, of skin color. Um, you know, there, we hail from different places and we have different ideas, um, but everyone uh, is, is really committed to Skyart. And I think, um, you know, I, I don't take for granted the fact that I get to work in a place like this. Um, more places should be like this, right? Uh, but they're not. And, and so I know, for example, that the fact that uh, two, two out of uh, four of our ex other executive, our other directors are uh, Black females. Um, Sarah Ward is, is an uh is also an incredible um, leader. And so I get to work with like three amazing uh, and powerful women every day. Uh, and then the rest of the team um, are, are, are just incredible as well. So I think that's some of the stuff we don't see on the back end is like the, the people who write the grants, you know, the people who take care of the building or, you know, do the payroll. Um, all those things are really important um, when we're thinking about like what it takes to, uh, to make a difference. Um, so at Skyr, we, we uh, have a lot of different programs. We have a program called Skyway uh, for young children. Um, one, of the, one of the hallmarks of our programs is that we use mindful moments and, and reflection. Um, these are these, these social emotional learning SEL elements that are so important. Uh, and then another really important aspect is that we're giving uh, kids um, the freedom to choose the things that they want to work on. Uh, so we have this big square, uh, 6,000 square foot studio and there's different studio spaces set up and the kids actually get to choose where they want to go, which teaching artists they want to work with. Um, we're hiring teaching artists from the community. Uh, Maria, who was in the last slide, um, is, is, is from the neighborhood. Um, you know, uh, the kids work collaboratively, collaboratively, as you can see on the left here, they're actually doing like a painting through a data script, which this is the result of that data script. And I love this work as emblematic of the kind of work we're doing. So we're, uh, you know, we're going in the inner, we're going uh, in into the inner city with these kids and we're really teaching them instead of uh, skill-based artwork, it's really process-based artwork, right? It's really about, um, uh, you know, having them use creativity as a tool for self-exploration, um, for that emotional learning, um, uh, for the emotional intelligence, self-confidence, uh, things like that. Um, this on the left is Hector Garcia, who's an incredible ceramicist and artist um, from originally from California, but of Mexican descent, uh, lives in Oaxaca, great. Uh, he, he came and did a studio visit with the kids, which was so cool. On the right, Derek Clemens, who's a local artist, you know, teaching the kids woodworking. Uh, so there's a, we, there's a really uh, wide variety of things that we, we do with the kids, um, but there's always this, this bookend of the mindful moment where we just, maybe we take a few deep breaths with them, we check in, we're, we're teaching them some of the self-regulation skills. Um, 
and we'll talk a little bit more about why that's important in a second. Um, you know, these are some of the, the, the things that come out of this, some of the exercises that we do. This was a, a, a filmmaker was visiting um, and uh, he was doing an activity with the kids uh, talking about um, racism and, um, you know, the, their experience of that. And this, this is a kid who was, uh, you know, just six or seven years old. And, and you can see uh, in the way he wrote this, but, uh, and, it, and it's funny, but it's tragic, tragic, right? Dino Trump, please stop bending, being mean and leave us alone and let's our parents live in peace. And you could assume, you know, uh, maybe his parents um, are here illegally. Uh, you know, you imagine that this kid is receiving that secondary trauma of his, or primary trauma even of uh, his parents living in constant fear of, of being deported. Um, so I, I love this piece. I think it's adorable, but it's also tragic, right? Um, this is a project that we do called Make Your Mark where kids come into the space and they uh, literally make their mark in the space, affirm their presence. You know, it's a way of separating the outside from what's going on inside the space. Um, and, and it helps create this culture of uh, collaborative collaboration. Um, again, this process-based work, uh, we love these works. We think they're world-class, they're, they're big. They're, you know, eight, eight to 10 feet wide and, you know, six feet tall. Um, and, and we do one of these with the kids for every session. Um, so that's just a, a really fast uh, overview of some of our programs. Here's some special programs that we do. Um, this was a group of kids from Mexico that we actually sponsored to come to uh, Chicago. Uh, so we covered uh, the expenses of, of this whole group, their, their passports, their visas. People don't realize that you, Mexicans need a visa to just to visit the United States and it's, it's not always granted. So we had to help them with that process. We hired a lawyer. Um, and then we brought a group of, uh, of young girls from, of young women from um, Chicago to Mexico City for a week, uh, which is what, what these photos are from. Um, again, we paid for their passports. Uh, for me, this was like one of the most meaningful things uh, in my experience at SkyArt, because uh, I think giving someone a passport in, in some ways sort of like gives them uh, the keys to the world, right? Um, you know, we're talking about uh, low income populations that where there's not an opportunity to leave your neighborhood, let alone leave the country. Um, so, the, uh, you know, it was, it's, it was jarring for some of the kids. It was, it was difficult to not speak the language, uh, be in a different environment. Um, but, you know, they got to see uh, Tenochtitlan, which is this, this pyramid on the left here. Um, on the right is um, uh, the canals to the, to the south of Mexico City, where, which were the Aztec canals. Um, this is Rodrigo Hernandez, who's an artist of Mexican descent. Um, giving them a, a talk about his, his work um, at the SAPS, the Centro de las Artes de, de, um, de El Porifolo Siqueros, I think. I forget what SAPS stands for, <laughs> excuse me. Um, but Rodrigo is an incredible artist and, and we did a series of studio visits um, with different artists. Oh, I forgot to mention, uh, this was the group from Mexico and some of our kids um, at the Art Institute of Chicago with Maite Borjabaj who's a, a curator from Spain. Um, she's the curator of architecture and design at the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so, so this sort of like internationalism is also uh, really near and dear to me. It's been something that's been, uh, that, that's important for me to bring to SkyArt and, and something that we're really interested in expanding. We're um, beginning a partnership right now with an organization called One Rio in, in Rio uh, in Brazil. Um, we're we're gonna be doing a, a virtual partnership with them, um, but hope to hope to make that an in-person partnership. Um, because again, I think opening up um, keys to other places is, is, is really important. Um, I know that for me, um, traveling and being able to leave the United States and uh, it, it literally makes your world bigger, right? I mean, you kind of um, learn the way, learn different ways of thinking, different ways of looking at the world. Um, Skyward also has a garden. Um, you know, one of the things that our founder Sarah Ward thinks about a lot. She's an, she's an art therapist. Um, and uh, we, we talk a lot about Maslow's pyramid of needs, right? At the bottom is like safety, food, shelter. Uh, and so, you know, a kid cannot be expected to be creative and, and sit still in art class uh, if they're hungry. Um, so this is our garden. It's four city lots, 15,000 square feet. Um, a lot of the land in the neighborhood is actually toxic, as I mentioned earlier. Um, we actually, uh, this, this land, we, all the dirt was removed and, and new dirt was brought in. Uh, we get um, beautiful dirt every year and um, we have incredible bounty from this garden. Um, and then we, the kids actually cook. Uh, this was our old kitchen, uh, obviously pre-COVID. Um, and then this is our new kitchen that we finished literally right before the pandemic hit. Um, 
So there, I mean, it, it, we're doing so many things, it's really hard to kind of summarize, but at Skyrite, we serve over 3,000 kids every year. Last year, we served over 4,000 kids. Um, when the pandemic happened, um, you know, we were really hitting our stride. We had just had 70, over 70, I think 72 kids in our space in one day, which was a record. Um, it was kind of crazy, um, but we were, you know, we were, we were at a really great place where, um, you know, the demand was there. We had just launched this, this plan to expand to the West side, which is a neighborhood that we're not historically in. Um, you know, after 20 years of being uh, on the South side in South Chicago on the same block, uh, we decided that we were ready to move to the West side, which is, you know, there's uh, similarly underinvested neighborhoods uh, on the West side. And we felt like that was important, but then the pandemic happened and, and kind of put everything on hold. Um, one of the first things we did was just rush and, and gather art supplies because we know that our, our kids, many of them uh, don't have art supplies at home. Um, so this was our, this was, and you could tell this was really early. This was probably like March 20 something, you know, like right after the stay at home order. You can tell we're not wearing masks. We didn't, we didn't know what to do yet. Um, so, what, you know, we're just started handing art supplies out the door. I think this is our, our little first table of art supplies. We just threw them together. Um, and then this became a, a, a big thing. Um, Basha Brown, our assistant director of development, set us a very ambitious goal of giving away a thousand art kits. And we were like, what? I don't know if we're going to be able to do that. Uh, and, and we exceeded that goal. I think we hit 1,200. Uh, and I'm happy to say that this year, uh, our fiscal year 2021, uh, which ends uh, June 30th, uh, we're actually on track to deliver 2,000 art kits. Um, so, you know, by the end of this fiscal year, we will we'll have hit more than 3,000 art kits delivered. Um, we're delivering those to kids' houses. Um, and so this is Deontay, he, he, he loads the Skyart van up with art kits uh, and he drives them directly to kids' houses. Uh, we're delivering them to schools, to, to different organizational partners. Um, and um, I think one very important aspect of our program is that it's free. Um, you know, kids never pay for this. They don't pay for their art supplies. Um, we're driving them to their house. Um, you know, during the pandemic, we even started rent, uh, we started buying uh, iPads and, and created a library of 50 iPads that we're loaning out to, to participants. Um, this is our COVID setup. You know, I'm really, really proud of the fact that um, we started in-person programming on July 8th of 2020. So, uh, you know, the stay at home order had just lifted. Uh, we knew it was really important to be there in person for our kids. So we had a small intensive uh, cohort of our project third space program, which is our team program. And um, this is this is what it looked like, you know, everybody wearing masks, each kid with their own supplies. And we've been kind of operating this way uh, for the last year. And I'm, you know, I'm happy to say that this summer things are opening up and, and we're going to be able to expand our programming. But, um, you know, through the ARCIS, through webinars, uh, we were we were able to serve a lot of kids and um, you know quickly develop this this hybrid program. So you know these kids had their iPad uh, so that they knew you know there was a there was a COVID scare. One of our staff uh, got COVID and we had to shut down, and they were able to tune in right away on their iPad. So um, that kind of uh, nimbleness uh, and responsiveness is something that we're gonna we're gonna take with us. Uh, this is an art intervention that kids made, like uh, you know flyers. This was this was right around. Um, uh, when uh, George Floyd was happening and, and uh, the Black Lives Matter protests. And so the kids sort of like created their own political statements about peace, as you can see. And, and, and we went out and, uh, you know, stapled them and boarded up storefronts and stuff around South Chicago and did this art intervention. And, uh, you know, you never know what, what teenagers are going to be into, but they were really into this. Uh, you know, sometimes you have like a, 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 a famous artist and they're like falling asleep because the famous artist is giving them an artist talk. But, um, this they, this they love they love doing this um so that is a very quick and dirty um overview of um, some of skyrat's programs i want to get into um specifically some of the work we do um with art therapy and with uh, incarcerated youth because those are some of some of our newer programs during the pandemic uh it, it became clear that a lot of our uh, the kids in our communities were experiencing uh, trauma not only from the pandemic but you know all the the social unrest that was happening at the same time, and not to mention the things that existed long before the pandemic. Um, so we, we created a program called Project Impact um, at, you know, in, in the spring of 2020, and, and we're really bolting it together. I was running, we, we hired some art therapists, we, uh, we started contacting families, we sent out a survey um, 
you know, asking who would be interested in, in, in our therapy. We sent it to like 100 families. We got like 75 people sign up for our therapy. Um, you know, we asked them if they were concerned about their kids, concerned about their well being, if they had food, how many devices they have in their house, whether they have a computer or a laptop, or if they're, you know, doing Zoom on their phone. Uh, for school, which was which the case for for a lot of families, right? I mean, COVID um, and and online schooling and all those things uh, was not did not hit everybody equally at all. Uh, we're talking about you know, like I said, families who uh, all the kids are trying to go to school on like one um, you know one internet device or they don't have adequate internet. You know, I, you know, I, we had board members who were complaining that the Wi-Fi wasn't good enough in their house. So uh, you can only imagine uh, some some of the um, the families who who don't have as many resources. Um, so one of my jobs as, as the director of programs being in charge of our, all of our programs was to really uh, begin informing myself about, um, uh, about mental health, um, about art therapy, um, and about specifically um, trauma in, in children. Um, and um, to go back, when I, was in, when I was at PNCA, Barry Sanders, who now runs the Oregon Institute for Creative Research, um, had an internship program called Over These Prison Walls. Uh, and I worked with uh, incarcerated youth through that in in internship program um, at the Donald E. Long Detention Center in Portland. And even then, you know, Portland is like 95% white and all of the kids in the Donald E. Long Detention Center were black and brown. Um, so, you know, since then I've been really interested in working with incarcerated youth. I worked with um, migrants who were like living in an illegal shelter in Mexico City, teaching art classes. Um, but you know, at Skyart, we really had the opportunity to start to formalize that program. So um, building out Project Impact and building out the Just Us program uh, has been one of, one of my big passions. Um, so what are ACEs, adverse childhood experiences? Um, ACEs describe a set of commonly experienced adversities that can be easily assessed in a clinical community or court settings. Uh, so the ACEs study is, is fairly old. It's probably 25 years old or something like that. Um, but uh, it really, uh, there's, a, there's a series of circumstances, abuse, neglect, um, hunger, um, you know, violence uh, that, that uh, determine um, the, a child's ACE score. So children with an average of four ACEs live with a four to 12 fold increase in health risk for alcoholism, drug abuse, depression, and suicide attempt, a two to four fold increase in smoking, poor self-rated health, um, 50 or more sexual intercourse partners and sexually transmitted diseases. Um, ACEs account for around 750 billion in annual GDP loss just in North America. Um, children living in low income households tend to experience a greater number of ACEs than their higher income peers. Um, you know, when we're thinking about poverty, when we're thinking about crime, when we're thinking about violence in these communities, um, there, you know, trauma has to be part of the conversation. Uh, you know, it's generational trauma. Um, it's trauma that's caused by systemic racism. It's systemic racism. It's, it's trauma that um, dates back, uh, like I said, generations. Um, so, children with higher ACE scores, um, the those traumatic experiences uh, negatively affect their development, their academic achievement, their ability to self-regulate. So that means their ability to, um, you know, calm themselves down, to act appropriately. Um, and so, you know, unfortunately, one of the um, great disservices that we're doing to children all over this country is that in low-income uh, communities, the schools do not receive um, adequate funds or resources to deal with uh, the, you know, um, the trauma that these kids have experienced, right? And instead of um, looking at uh, the their, the way they act out as a uh, as a symptom, um, we're we're we act punitively, right? Um, so there, there's this great book called "The Body Keeps Score" by Bessel A. Van der Kolk. Um, you know, and this is a quote from him: "As the ACE study has shown, child abuse and neglect is the single most preventable cause of mental illness, the single most common cause of drug and alcohol abuse, and a significant contributor." To leading causes of death such as diabetes, heart disease, cancer, stroke, and suicide. Um, I really encourage you to read this book. I'm going to skip the second uh, quote in the interest of time. Um, but I want to talk specifically about incarcerated youth because, again, this is something that uh, I'm really passionate about. I think uh, people don't think about kids in jail, right? Uh, at the Donald E. Long Detention Center, the kids that we were working with were uh, locked up for uh, crazy inhumane amounts of time uh, because they're charged as adults. Um, if you ask me, children should never be charged as adults. Um, children should never be incarcerated. Uh, but in many states in this country, there are laws that allow children to be persecuted as adults for um, crimes that are of a certain seriousness. Um, 
So through Skyers Just Us program, uh, we go into uh, two different detention facilities once a week. Um, one is like a, a prison where kids are actually serving out their sentence and the other is a pre-adjudicated uh, justice involved youth. It's like an alternative uh, setting, which is uh, more humane and, and lower security. Um, but through Skyers Just Us program, our therapists and artists work with justice involved youth and processing and community and trauma, improving self-regulation and feeling safe. Uh, um, you know, creating basic safety is one of the most important uh, ways, one of the most important foundations for uh, beginning to overcome some of this trauma. And, and uh, one of the reasons why kids in low income communities are uh, so traumatized is that that, that basic sense of safety um, doesn't exist from them from a, doesn't exist for them uh, from a very young age. Um, so just uh, some stats, 80% of juvenile justice involved youth report at least one adverse childhood experience uh, with an average of six traumatic experiences. So uh, we saw in that previous slide that just with four ACEs, your, you know, your chances of all these adverse health outcomes uh, increase dramatically. Um, traumatized youth sometimes engage in dangerous behavior in order to feel less numb or terrified or in an attempt to self-regulate. Normal activities like school or a family barbecue can cause them to feel panicked or disassociated. Um, so this explains why uh, some kids act the way they do, right? Why, why they're inconsolable, why um, they act out in school, um, why they end up uh, committing crime, uh, why they end up uh, why the recidivism rate is so high for some of these institutions. Um, and unfortunately, um, having worked in several of these institutions, you, you, uh, you come away with a real sense that um, not much is being done to habilitate them, right? I mean, jails talk about rehabilitation, but there's no, there's no re, there, there, and there's no habilitation. Um, you know, the, they sort of um, get out to the exact same traumatic situation um, that got them in there in the first place. Um, so unfortunately, unless we're treating the root cause of that trauma, um, kids are, are, are very, very likely to uh, re-offend and end up uh, in and out of incarceration for their whole lives. Um, sorry, let me go back. Um, so just, and, and to illustrate this point, I mean, um, being involved in the justice system means that these young people are also more likely to fall victim to gun violence and other forms of violence. Uh, you know, in, just in Chicago, nearly 80% of homicide victims have at least one prior arrest and the average number of prior arrests for homicide victims in Chicago is 9.5. So it's not random people that are getting shot. It's people in these neighborhoods that are in the system, that are traumatized by the system, that are traumatized by systemic racism, that are in neighborhoods that are not safe. Um, so it's a vicious cycle. Um, you know, of those victims, 31% and 34% respectively were previously arrested for possession of illegal guns or for a violent crime. You know, the kids that we work with in jail tell us that they've been shot. Um, many of them have had loved ones that were killed in front of them. Um, so, so we see this firsthand. Um, just in just this year so far, I mean, we're not even in June yet, uh, 108 children have been shot in Chicago and 16 have been killed. Uh, this is uh, sort of our version of Make Your Mark that we did with uh, a group of incarcerated youth over a series of a couple months. Uh, it was uh, myself and Sarah Ward, who's our executive direct director. Um, she's an art therapist, and I'm more of just an artist hanging out with the kids. Um, but what, one thing that's really interesting when you look at this is we always have to fight in these institutions to let kids quote unquote gang bang. You know, they're not supposed to, they're not supposed to be themselves. They're not supposed to, they're not supposed to write their gang tags or whatever. And we always say, Hey, this is a therapeutic group. Let them, we want to let them gang bang. So we, we get permission to let them do that. And then the reason I love this work, and I think it's so emblematic of, of what we're trying to do is it creates a fuller portrait of who these kids actually are. Um, you can see that, you know, there's, there's gang stuff, but then we have hearts, we have these colors, um, you know, it turns into this beautiful abstract work that creates a more fuller portrait of who these kids can be. Um, the other things that we do that um, Sarah really started doing that inspired me is that we draw the kids. Uh, the kids never have someone look at them for that long. They don't look at people in the eye. Uh, so this is a drawing I did of one young man and I put a crown on his head and, uh, and, and you know, he was ecstatic. You know, it, it really made him happy, really made him feel seen. You know, the kids tell us like, oh, I've never looked in someone's eyes for that long before. Um, so it's a big deal. Uh, I'm going to move through these quickly, talking about rescuing specificity and, and sacrificing sensationalism. So I think that's one of the most uh, key things uh, when it comes to uh, be doing community organizing, doing activism. Um, you know, I think the word like the words like woke and, and doing the work, um, you know, they're oversimplified, they're reductionist. Uh, you know, I think I, I really want to demand specificity. Um, so, but a couple more quotes from Vanderkoek about, you know, and I think this speaks well to Skyart's work. 
Um, imagination is absolutely critical to the quality of our lives. Our imagination enables us to leave our routine everyday existence by fantasizing about, tra fantasizing about travel, food, sex, um, falling in love or having the last word, all the things that make life interesting. interesting. Imagination gives us the opportunity to envision new possibilities. It is, an, it is an essential launch pad for making our hopes come true. It fires our creativity, relieves our boredom, alleviates our pain, enhances our pleasure and enriches our most intimate relationships. Um, sadly, he goes on, our education system, as well as many of the methods that profess to treat trauma, tend to bypass this emotional engagement system and focus instead on recruiting for the cognitive capacity of the mind, like teaching skills instead of um, treating the trauma. Um, you know, he goes on to say the last thing that should be cut from school schedules are chorus, physical education, recess, and anything else involving movement, play, and joyful engagement. So safety and joy are key foundations for uh, overcoming some of this trauma. Uh, and then I, to illustrate this point, I wanted to sort of um, demonstrate SkyArt's uh, program design. These are our three main program areas, Project, Project Impact being our, our therapy program area, Project Third Space is our team program, and Skyway is our, our, our program for, for teens. But this is sort of how we envision all of our programs, there's this overlap. In the middle is our family table and garden program, which is like we're meeting kids' basic needs, and only once their basic needs are met uh, can we begin to approach some of these other stuff. Um, one of the things that we have to ask when people are saying they're doing the work or, or they're activists, it's, it's what are the outcomes that they're working on? What are their goals? Um, so, so this is a, a piece of SkyArt's logic model um, where some of the things that we're working on to increase in our kids are, um, we wanna increase their sense of connectedness to people, to places, to mediums, to their self. Um, you know, specifically for Project Impact for Art Therapy, we want to increase their sense of well-being. Um, so we're, you know, we want to expose them to diversity, we want to uh, demonstrate, uh, we want to expose them to opportunities for demonstrating empowerment and freedom of choice. Um, we want to build community through expression, collaboration, shared meals and exposure. And then uh, for the therapeutic program, uh, it's really about the improved ability to process and communicate trauma, improving their self-confidence, their self-esteem, and very importantly, their empathy for others. Um, we measure these things with surveys, uh, with participant artworks and, and narrative, with focus groups, with parents, um, with, with teacher debriefs, uh, and with interview narratives. So these are, you know, uh, this is a, a sort of a template of, of outcomes and, and how you can measure them. Um, so this is a little bit more of uh, the discussion about the, the title and, and what I was thinking. Uh, th this is this quote from David Brooks in the New York Times. The thing we call wokeness contains many elements. At its core is an honest and good faith effort to grapple with the legacies of racism. In 2021, this element of wokeness has produced more understanding, inclusion, and racial progress than we've seen over 50 years. This part of wokeness is great, which I totally agree. But wokeness gets weirder when it's entangled in the perversities of our meritocracy, when it involves demonstrating one's enlightenment by using language, problematize, heteronormativity, heteronormativity cisgender, intersectionality, and calculate it in elite schools or with difficult texts. So it's not that these words are bad, it's that you know, this language is necessarily um, elite, right? It's, it's, it's by design, it's elite. It's, it's created for people and by people who uh, use that language, understand that language, have that language. Um, on the ground level, the communities who um, we're, we're, we're working with um, don't, you know, that's, that's not what they're concerned with, right? They're not concerned with, um, you know, the, the right language or the right um, title. They're concerned with, you know, eating and, and uh, surviving, right? I mean, traumatized communities are, are surviving on a day-to-day -day basis um, because uh, unfortunately the, their, their basic needs are not being met, that, that need for safety um, is not met. Um, so if, if you are woke, do you acknowledge your own privilege? How are you using your privilege? Are you part of the communities that you claim to speak for? What have you personally sacrificed or given for the causes you champion? Would you take a pay cut in order to advance the cause or causes that you care about? If you're doing the work, what specific project are you working on? What are the outcomes of that project? How are you measuring those outcomes? How are you receiving feedback from the community you serve about your project? Um, what does activism look like in the real world? Activism is analog. You know, I don't think um, that we have a lot of armchair activists uh, who are out there on social media and uh, that's not activism, sorry. Um, activism is possible through community and teamwork. So it's not focused on the individual personality or celebrity. And I think that's where, you know, artists who are interested in, in activism um, fall into that trap a lot, right? It's like they're, they're taught as artists that it's all about them when activism is all about us. Activism is specific and activism is long-term. Um, a diatribe about social media, um, basically the algorithm used by social media um, was originally created by gambling companies to keep you engaged. Social media's only goal 
the, the social media companies have one God, which is engage, engagement. Engagement is your time and that's money for them. So they should really be paying you. Um, but <laughs> going viral means truth right now. Uh, and Goya warned us about this, right? Um, in his truth of, or in his uh, danger of wars, Prince. Um, there's this great book by Jaron Lanier, who was, he's called the um, Silicon Valley, um, the Oracle of Silicon Valley. And he has this book called 10 Arguments for Deleting Your Social Media Accounts right now. And he's one of the people that helped create social media. Um, and now he's, he's saying that we need to quit it. But he said, What's, what might have once been called advertising must now be understood as continuous behavior modification on a titanic scale. To free yourself, to be more authentic, to be less addicted, to be less manipulated, to be less paranoid, for all these marvelous re reasons, delete your accounts. Um, so I, I certainly uh, encourage you to take some distance from social media, especially if um, you want to be activists, if you want to make a difference in communities. Um, he says that speaking through social media isn't really speaking at all. Context applies to what you say after you say it for someone else's purpose and profit. I'm going to skip that other one because we have, we're running short on time. Um, I love this quote by Toni Morrison. She said, I tell my students, when you get these jobs that you have been so brilliantly trained for, just remember that you, your real job is that you, if you are free, you need to free somebody else. If you have some power, then your job is to empower somebody else. This is not, not just a grab bag candy game. I love this quote by James Baldwin. James Baldwin uh, writing to his nephew about um, living in a man, in, in a world where um, black people are inferior to white people um, and, and, and how that feels and um, you know how, um, white people don't understand um, anything different because that's what, that's what they've known their whole life. So he says, many of them talking about white Americans indeed know better, but as you will discover, people find it very difficult to act on what they know. To act is to be committed and to be committed is to be in danger. In this case, the danger in the minds of most white Americans is the loss of their identity. And so I think this still rings really true today with what we've seen uh, just in the last four or five years. Um, you know, this, this fear of, of, of loss of, of some kind of identity, some kind of pure Americanness. Um, but, but the part that I think rings really true is that to, to act is to be committed and to be committed is to be in danger. And so, you know, I think when we're thinking about activism, again, it's, it's, it's um, what, are, what are you giving? Um, what, what, what kind of commitment is, is happening? Um, or are you simply commentating? Um, and then this is one of my all time favorite quotes uh, by Frederick Douglass. Uh, I prayed for 20 years, but received no answer until I prayed with my legs. And so I think this rings true with uh, some of the protests that we've seen for the, some of the Black Lives Matter protests. Um, but also just, I think it just speaks to uh, moving your feet and, and, and moving in the world and uh, doing things that um, uh, are specific and not sensationalist. Um, so this just to, in summary, you know, um, art in their hands is really powerful, not necessarily in museums. Not that, you know, museums are unsalvageable when we're thinking about creating change, um, you know, art that's hanging in museums um, isn't as powerful as art in the hands of the community. Um, helping people makes you happy. Helping people makes you feel good. You don't have to worry about being a famous artist if you're helping people. Um, safety, again, is the, the, the building block, the, the building block of, of helping to heal trauma, uh, joy, uh, healing, self-actualization. This is again referencing Maslow's pyramid of needs. Um, is the art in their hands or is it in yours? Who has the power, right? Um, is, are you thinking of uh, art and activism? Is activism a subject or is a medium? So I, I think a lot of um, artists use activism as a subject and not necessarily as a medium. Um, Danella Meadows has this great idea about leverage points where you find a leverage point, a place where a system is vulnerable and you push. Uh, so look at Danella Meadows, she's great. Um, you can tell a press community what they should care about, ask what they care about. Um, don't fall into the marketing trap of poverty or trauma voyeurism, don't be a bummer. Bummer is a term that you'll understand when you read that Jaron Lanier book. It's uh, people who are essentially internet trolls. Um, sometimes the best way to be woke is to give money to organizations who are really doing the work. And that's okay. You know, I think uh, it, it seems counterintuitive, but it really is the best way uh, to literally have the bang for your buck. You might not receive the, the recognition. It might not create the, the image of the, the woke person that you are seeing to create, but it really is um, effective. Uh, thank you for letting me go on so long. That was a lot to get through. Uh, I would love to answer some of your questions.
Thank you very much. That was amazing and very, very informative. Um, yeah, so for everyone that is here, um, if you would like to put some questions in the Q&A that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen, um, we will be able to answer them as we go. And the more the merrier, we would love to hear your thoughts and any questions about um, all of this amazing work that you've been doing. So um, to get us started, I guess I had a few questions. Um, first and foremost, while we all are here, what can we do um, to support your mission, um, to support the mission and the success of these kids that you're working with? Is there anything literal that we can do within the next two minutes, five minutes? Um, and what are some of the things we can keep our eyes open for in the future? Absolutely. Uh, you can go to www.skyart.org and donate money. Perfect. You know, I, you know, as I said, I think um, one of the things that happens, is, you know, especially with uh, creative people and artists, it's like they, they come to a community and they're like, oh, I really want to do a project in this community. Like, how can we work together? And, and they might get offended when we're like, you can give us money. Um, but but that's just that's just the honest to God truth. I think, um, as I had said, activism is long term. It's not something that you can come in and do a project and expect to really make an impact in someone's life. That's not to say it's not possible. You know, there are projects that are incredibly inspiring, but Really, when it comes down to it, the best way to make a difference is to give money to people that are already doing those things. There are organizations all around the country that are doing incredible work that need money. Um, the nonprofit game is tough. We, you know, raising money is hard. You know, um, it costs uh, it costs Skyer over a million dollars a year to do what we do, and so we have to raise that much money in order to do this work, in order to, to serve those three thousand kids. So it's a big investment per child, and that's important. So um, money money is uh, is on, honestly the the best answer I have for you. Awesome, yeah, and I just put that um, link in there so you can really easily click on that now or um, in a little bit. So we have a question in our Q&A and here it is. In thinking through wokeness, how does it compare from Mexico to the US? Do you notice any similarities or differences? Um, that's a really interesting question actually. You know, um, I think sort of the conversation of wokeness has really exploded uh, since since the pandemic, right? Um, you know, I, I I was in Mexico, I guess, at the beginning of it. You know, during uh, most of Trump's presidency, for example. I think you know one of the topics in Mexico that's really common is neoliberalism, which we never talk about in the United States. You know, this idea of of this uh, sort of like false liberalism, which is actually like rampant capitalism. This sort of like uh, this guise of um, of neoliberalism that's actually like uh, ravaging the environment, uh, creating more poverty and, and, and divide between the rich and the poor. Uh, so so Mexico has a very Marxist bend to it. So activism and sort of of wokeness in Mexico is like is very Marxist and there's a you know a long you know uh, I wrote this this funny article because uh, Leon Trotsky was murdered in Mexico because Mexico has long harbored um, you know the sort of Marxist leanings uh, and, and and that like very much carries through you know mm -hmm. the history of the Zapatistas in Mexico um, but you know Mexico also has a, a strong um, tradition of, of activism but I you know one crazy key difference in Mexico is that activists in Mexico put their lives at risk and they're killed um, and they're murdered, you know, and journalists are murdered. Uh, you know, Mexico is one of the most dangerous places in the world to be a journalist. Um, and I was a journalist in Mexico and it's scary. You know, like I said, my house got broken into. And um, so I think there's, there's a difference there in sort of what's at stake. Um, I think in the United States, the, the conversation of wokeness, I think one of the points I wanted to make today is that uh, if you're woke in the United States, a lot of times you have the privilege to be woke, right? You have access to that language, you have access to that education. Um, in Mexico, a lot of times it's literally like my community doesn't have water, right? Like, so, so the activism is very need-based in Mexico and in the United States, I find at least that um, a lot of the conversation uh, is very like social media centric, uh, performative, I guess is, is how I would say that. Right, it allows for that sort of falsity and ease to that comes with um, non-action. Exactly. Um, we have another question here. It says, hi, Devon, long time fan of your work. I can imagine your work can sometimes weigh heavy in between moments of joy. With activism being long-term work, how do you handle long-term mental health and wellness for yourself? Thank you for that question. Um, a, a couple things that I would say. Um, overall, uh, nonprofit is, is a high burnout industry. And especially if you're working uh, in communities uh, like the communities we're working in, where you're exposed to gun violence, you're exposed to um, you know a lot of a, a lot of secondary trauma, um, and and it does it does weigh on you heavily. Um, I think for you know every and everybody's going to have sort of their personal um, ways of dealing with that. Uh, you know, for me personally, a couple of things. I think Skyart being the nurturing 
uh, creative environment that it is. And, and, you know, me feeling joy at, at going to Skyward every day, you know, w- when lockdown happened and I was able to, and we, we were kind of like going by Skyward and doing some work, putting together our kids. But when we started going back again, when the kids came back to the space, like I was, I was overjoyed because, uh, because I really love being there. And I think like, uh, you know, over 20 years of Skyward, the culture has been created to make a very healing space. So, so that is, is a great foundation to start with, but then, you know, especially like working in the jail, um, uh, you know, around that population, you you are exposed to um, some pretty harsh reality, and 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 uh, so you know, I guess for myself, one of the things that I do is is exercise, uh, mindfulness. You know, I I have a run, I have a running practice. I've been running for ten years. I actually started in Oregon uh, because I, you know I, I was having um, some mental health issues. I, I was feeling uh, some depression. I think you know, seasonal seasonal depression in, in Oregon is real. Uh, and so for me, sort of taking care of myself uh, physically has always been the foundation for my mental health. Um, but I think, you know, with this work in particular, it's something that I've had to learn that, you know, I can't bring it up um, in an everyday setting. You know, I can't be like, oh, this kid told me his brother got shot in the head next to him. You know, it's like, cause that's the kind of stuff I hear. Um, and, and saying that to someone, I think like you, you can actually like traumatize other people. Um, and so I think also learning, um, when, when to kind of internalize something or, or more healthy ways to do it. So I, I certainly encourage people to seek out um, therapists that they can work with. I think it's important that, um, you know, especially as, as we work with a community of therapists, it's important that um, we sort of uh, work, work with therapists as well. Yeah, amazing. And, and you're, you're right. There's in, in all of this, there's a very high turnover rate. And it can be a rotating door because of burnout um, and intensity. So it's great that you're being mindful. Um, in that same vein, what are some of your most joyful memories, you know, specific joyful memories um, from some of this work that can be really heavy and can be really hard and have its dark moments? Um, what are some of the times where you've had a day where you're like, this is very worth it right now? Um, do you have any moments like that? So many, I can't even, I can't even uh, begin to start. You know, I think um, the, the, the joy far outweighs the, the suffering and, and, Sky art, which is incredible. I think again, over 20 years, this amazing culture has been created. I think definitely uh, the the trip to Mexico, you know, being able to like provide passports for a whole group of young people on both sides of the border. You know, it spoke to me personally as someone who had lived in Mexico. It's funny because that project actually started before I even started working at Sky Art, and it just happened to be that I was able. I really took it on, organized the whole thing, and did the itinerary. Uh, so that was huge. A big moment happened this year that I was really proud of, even though, um, you know, you, there's this there's this saying, it takes a village, right? And I think, um, you know, Sky Art could never take credit for like one kid's success because like, um, in, especially in these low income communities, so many things have to go right for these kids to quote unquote, get out of these communities or have opportunities to thrive. Um, but one of the things that we did this year for the first time was uh, set up uh, uh, portfolio reviews with the Art Institute of Chicago, which is obviously one of the best art schools in the country. Um, and they've had a fraught relationship with, with uh, low-income communities throughout Chicago, as many elite institutions do. Um, but we set up portfolio reviews and uh, we had like four or five kids that got in with scholarships. And then one of our kids uh, got, in, she got accepted to 10 different schools and got a scholarship to the Art Institute of Chicago. Um, so again, that's not like because of Sky Art, um, but certainly these are, these are kids that have been at Sky Art for, um, in, in many cases, years. And I think that's another thing that makes me really proud is that these kids stay with Sky Art um, for, uh, you know, it's not just like they come for one session. It's like they kind of grow up at Skyer. You know, they'll move from Skyway to Project Third Space to an internship. And so creating that continuity is also really important for us. Right. And getting able to being able to see kids succeed um, and have those relationships. That's amazing. Um, OK, we have a few more questions here. How big is the Sky Art team? I know you mentioned your record was approximately 72 kids in a day. But what are the average group sizes? And is it mainly after school that kids come and enjoy the space? And can community members come and volunteer with the kids? Yeah, absolutely. We are always looking for volunteers. Um, you can just stop by Sky Art and fill out a volunteer application. Um, to answer your question, we have, I think we have nine full-time staff right now. I'm happy to say that we're hiring. So keep a lookout. We're hiring a, a program coordinator. We're hiring a, a, a program manager for our Project Third Space team program. Uh, we just hired a social worker uh, to oversee our therapeutic program. So that program is like, we just solidified it. It's like, we, we put wheels on it. It's, we have processes. Um, so I'm super excited about that. Uh, and now, you know, those three sort of pillar programs are now gonna have their own managers, 
which is really exciting. We're hiring another development manager. So we're very much hiring as we're growing to the West side, we're actually going to open a second location on the West side. So certainly expanding our team. So the team's going to go from eight or nine to uh, 11 or 12 or 13 over the next uh, six months or so, which is very exciting. And then we always have a roster of teaching artists. So, um, we hire local artists from the communities that are essentially freelance um, artists with us. Um, and, you know, we, we pay them uh, pretty well. You know, they can make between 25 and $45 an hour. I would create a pay structure where um, if they don't have a degree, they can still earn that higher income through experience. Um, so for example, we have uh, one of our teaching artists started as a kid with us. And so like, that's also really important. Um, and, um, what was the other question? Oh, what's an average group size? Um, so our, our average group size, it's really hard to say, especially with COVID, right? Like right now we only have 15 kids in the space at a time. Um, I would say, but pre-COVID, it was not uncommon for to have 50 kids in the space every day. Um, you know, we work in Chicago public schools where you could have, you know, a class of 50 or a class of 20. Um, our project third space program, we do try to keep smaller because it's a, you know, the teens need to apply. We actually pay teens to be in that program, which I think is super important. Um, and, and we cap that at 30 or 35. Um, and then our therapy is like, we keep that really limited. We do a lot of one-on-one -on -one art therapy. Um, so we're, you know, delivering free one-on-one -on -one art therapy, which I think is awesome. And um, that's something we're super proud of. Uh, and then we do small groups of art therapies as well. So the group size range uh, a lot. Awesome. And is it mainly an after-school program or are kids coming in throughout the day? How's kind of the time structure look like? Thank you. I knew there was something else I was missing. Um, it is so during the school year, it's an after school program. And then our teen program happens on Saturday. So it's all day Saturday uh, from 1130 to 330. The teens get they get a, a really like a home cooked meal. We have chefs come in and cook a vegetarian meal for them. And then um, they have a lot of open studio time. So the teens get a lot of time to just explore and, and work on their own thing and really develop as artists. Um, and then during the summer, we do uh, weekday programming. So during the summer, it'll be more from like 1 p.m. to 5 p.m. Uh, and then during the school year, it's like 4 to 6 p.m. Okay, awesome. Um, all right, we have another question here. I love the art intervention portion of Sky Art. Has this always been part of the programming or is this mainly a response to the pandemic? I wonder what they mean by art intervention. I mean, I think um, art intervention, I think like, Skyart has always seen art and was founded by Sarah as this idea that art is inherently therapeutic. Right. Um, so I think it's like always been founded on the idea that um, art can be a constructive force in a, in a young person's life. Um, art can be something that um, helps young people uh, become more fully themselves. Uh, you know, not only can they like process trauma, but they can, um, you know, explore themselves, right? And unfortunately, uh, we know that the first things to be cut in, in some of these uh, these schools in low-income areas is, is the arts program. Uh, so in a lot of cases, we're just the art program. So we're just providing basic access to art in a lot of in a lot of cases. And I think like you could call that an intervention or you could call it like the, the right to creativity, you know? And actually uh, I'll take a second to note, I, I put a, 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 a link in the chat to a polis discussion if, if, if you all want to participate. Polis is a great platform for um, finding some kind of common ground. And actually the government of Taiwan has used it a lot to for policy. Um, but one of the questions is there is like, is creativity a human right? You know, and I think I would argue that it is. And unfortunately the, the education system, especially the punitive behavioral focused education system in low-income neighborhoods, uh, like sort of uh, unteaches or, or teaches kids not to be creative. So, and a lot of times it's like, you know, adults and kids alike are like, I'm not, I'm not an artist. I don't know how to draw. And it's like, no one cares if you know how to draw. It's like, it's like at art school, they're like, forget everything you know about drawing, you know? Um, and so we, we take that approach where it's like, it's not about like the, the skill or anything like that. It's about experimentation um, and sort of like creating that opening where, you, where you're really um, using materials, you're thinking with your hands. I love that, I love that phrase. Yeah, awesome. Um, they sent a clarifying when they meant the um, art intervention, they were referring to the hanging up of posters on the boarded up um, windows and things like that of businesses. Oh, th yeah, thank you for that question. So that was kind of the first time we've done that. Um, we've done like a lot of murals in the community. Mm -hmm. um, and then uh, we always try to present the, the participants, especially the teens with opportunities to display their work publicly. So the teens, uh, we, we do auctions where they can sell their work, they keep 75% of the proceeds. Um, we, we do exhibitions. They were actually in the, at the DuSable Museum here in Chicago a couple of years ago, which was really awesome. So that kind of like public sort of like street art intervention, that was the first time we've done something like that. Um, but it, certainly we, we work hard to create opportunities for them to uh, exhibit their work outside of Skyart. 
Awesome. Okay, this is the last question we have so far. So if folks have anything else they wanna add, go ahead and put it in the chat now um, so we can make sure we get all the questions answered. Do you have any suggestions for artists or creatives trying to enter the social justice sector as far as finding work in their cities, if not in an urban environment and still making ends meet? Um, referencing using activism as a medium. Yeah, thank you for that question. You know, I think what's what, and, and I think this is a sort of unique to Chicago because I hadn't really experienced this in other places, but in Chicago, there's this teaching, this thing called a teaching artist. And like in Portland, I never heard of being a teaching artist. Like I taught paint and sips for a while in Portland, which was like hilarious, but it's different, right? So in Chicago, there's this, you know, you there's there's a ton of nonprofits because there's a ton of need in Chicago. And, and uh, Chicago has some of the most innovative and incredible nonprofits in the world. Um, and and there's, so there's like a whole industry of being a teaching artist where you sort of work contractually. And a lot of our teaching artists, most of them actually work for multiple organizations. And they, so it's, it's great because they can work on their own schedule. It's contractual. They work part time. They get paid well. Their hourly rate is high. Uh, and then they have time for their own, for their own studio practice. Um, so I'm not sure sort of what models exist in other cities if there are teaching artists. I know a lot of, like I know New York has teaching artists, for example, some of the bigger cities for sure. Um, but I think there's, there's a, a lot of nonprofits function on um, uh, some kind of uh, uh, structure like that, like museums have teaching artists, right, where it's contractual work. Um, so I think there's, there's contractual opportunities with nonprofits. Um, where uh, you can go in and, and work with youth or work with, you know, any community, you know, there's a, there's a great organization here called Arts of Life and they work with um, a, a adult artists with developmental disabilities and they have artists go in and, and do art with them and, and they, it's like an art studio and it's awesome. Um, so there, there's a lot of different opportunities out there. Um, I think in terms of pursuing sort of full-time work, um, I think it's an experience thing. Um, again, you know, blessed be sky art for sort of recognizing my weird resume and, and wanting to hire me um but i think like you know if you start with volunteering like i had like i said i had worked with incarcerated youth in college i worked with migrants i had done a lot of reporting of on di of different kinds uh, you know i think writing is a great skill to have no matter what so uh, <laughs> writing helps for sure um but gaining experience in in a variety of ways helps and, and some of that might be volunteering um but some of that too is just, uh, you know, offer like work, you know, offering your services to, to organization and really just asking what they need. I think most of the time they'll have some kind of structure of like, hey, we hire artists this way. This is, you know, this is how, um, this is how we, we run our program. It's six weeks or 10 weeks or whatever. And then once, once you're in the door, we, I mean, we, we usually work with our artists for years at a time. Right, amazing. Um, well, I guess I have one question. Um, I know you said that you have changed a lot since you had the idea of sort of becoming a famous painter. Um, where are you now with sort of your own personal artwork um, and the stuff that you've been doing as an artist? Um, and how has that relationship changed with this sort of new growth and perspective? Yeah, you know, I think um, it's funny. I don't even like, I don't even know if I'm an artist. Like I, it's, like, I don't, I, for me, it's like, I don't care if I'm an artist or an activist or anything. Like I, I feel uh, incredibly blessed and grateful to be able to help people, um, to be able to bring art to people's lives. Like I, I, I believe fully in, in the power of art, but I, but I think, I think what I've, what I've come to is that I believe again in, in the power of art in, in other people's hands, right? Like not in my hands. Like I think it's healing to me to make art. I, I love making art and I feel really good when I'm making art, but I guess I, I really have tried hard to let go of like the need for validation when it comes to that. And I think right. unfortunately, like the whole art market is based on that, <laughs> like arbitrary and it's like really arbitrary validation. Like the art market is the only market where it doesn't matter if you're skilled at something, <laughs> you, you can be successful at it without being totally unskilled at it, which is kind of cool and punk, but um, <laughs> I think for me, it's like, you know, like when I make art, like when, you know, when I draw the kids in jail, that's, in, that's incredibly gratifying to me. And like, I, you know, it's, it's affirmative because they're like, oh man, you're so good at drawing and that's great. Um, but I think I, you know, I have like really no sort of um, aspiration to like exhibit work or anything like that. Like, I think I probably want to write a book and publish a book. You know, I think, um, you know, I published Arcoides to, you know, pretty much no attention at all. Uh, no publisher wanted to touch it. It was too weird. Um, but I think, you know, I, I would love to publish um, a book and maybe it'll be, you know, nonfiction. Maybe it'll be about this kind of work. Um, but yeah, I think, uh, you know, for me, it's just, I, I'm just trying to settle in and, and um, yeah. you know, be, be, be happy with where I'm at, be happy with where I am. You know, I think, again, I think the other thing I, I meant to say that I kind of forgot to say is that um, 
and, and I keep saying I'm blessed, but one of the reasons I say that is like, you know, I have the ability to do this work and be paid for it. And I recognize how special that is. Um, you know, I just purchased a home uh, and that's, that's something I would have never imagined doing uh, a couple of years ago, but I think it's important to sort of like demonstrate also to the youth that, you know, there's, there's any number of uh, career paths in art and actually being an artist is one of the most difficult and one of the most thankless um, and, 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 and not a very good way to make money, frankly. Right. Um, so, so yeah, that's, you know, for me, I'd like, and, and for me, buying a home was really a symbol of like settling into the work I'm doing now um, and, and being committed to it, you know, as, you know, Skyart grows and we're opening a second location, you yeah. know, once, <laughs> once Skyart has a whole new location and, and uh, you know, we're serving double our population, then maybe I can think about, you know, my own ambition. Totally. Well, that's amazing. Um... I think that's all the questions we have so far, um, but I really, really appreciate you coming on. I know the rest of Scale House and all the audience does too. Your thoughts were amazing. And once again, everyone go and check out Sky Art, click on the link, donate if you can. Um, and thank you very much for um, sharing everything that you're doing and some of these experiences. Thank you so much. It was an honor. Thank you. Have a great rest of your night. Bye everyone.